remain forever locked in prison of their own certainty. Frankly, I never met a practicing magician who believed in much, much in the occult. We're skeptics, we stage magicians are skeptics by training and temperament. The wizard told Dorothy, don't pay any attention. He said, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. And that's all we've ever wanted to do is look behind the curtain to see how it all works. Moreover, we've seen how easily the best and the brightest of us can be fooled. Will Rogers said we are all ignorant, but just about different things. Truth is, we are all gullible fools, but just about different things. I like this. I wrote this. <laughs> the modern man who is too thoroughly educated to believe in the preposterous idea of the real presence of Christ in the Blessed Sacrament is perfectly willing to accept the incredible and useless implications of quantum theory such as the idea of infinite parallel universes. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> it's true. Skepticism can be useful, but it can be dangerous. Skepticism ultimately turns on itself. You start to lose confidence in the last in instrument you can trust, your own mind. My adolescent hero, Emerson, said, nothing is at last sacred but the integrity of your own mind. I loved that when I was young, and now it doesn't impress me so much. Uh, recently, I watched my parents disappear into dementia, which, by the way, is something that also happened to Emerson. None of us in this room can rely consistently on the integrity of his own mind. It's too easy to lose our way, or our mind, for that matter. If you'd be safe in this universe, you need something greater than your own mind. My passion for arcane knowledge as a kid and as a young man extended far beyond stage illusions, hypnotism, mind reading, and the like, but I wanted to know all of that stuff. But I wanted to know the workings of everything, even the grandest things. And I spent nearly 50 years of my life in a self-directed quest for the secret of life, the true philosophy. I'm sure I'm not alone in that. There's other, others here who would say that's been their hobby or passion. Of course, I was looking for God even the times when I tried to be an atheist, and I tried on about everything my built-in biases would allow. My foundational bias was Protestantism. I didn't know that. I used the term not in a formal sense, but to describe an unconscious assumption, an attitude of mind. I think Americans have Protestantism in their DNA, even Catholic Americans. After all, wasn't our nation born from violent protest against those with titular authority? We take pride in our ordinary independence and we love to question authority. My unquestioned assumption was the preeminence of my own conscience, my own judgment over any outside authority. It was my guidestone. I would go it alone. And being a product of my culture, it never occurred to me that there could be an external authoritative source of truth. I just didn't think there could be. Like many, I was the arbiter of what came in. I was, shall we say, my own pope. Worse yet, though I read prolifically, I had no formal training in philosophy, theology, or logic. Still don't. That probably shows. <laughs> but take it from me, the truth seeker who directs his own search has a fool for a guide. Over many years I embraced and I discarded a menagerie of philosophies. My first great love was Emerson, followed by Thoreau. College, I took a turn at Alan Watts, the brilliant East meets West charlatan, the Krishnamurti, the Theosophists, the Theosophists, the I Am movement, which the only guy I ever met that knew about the I Am movement was Al Cresta. It was a bizarre cult in the 1930s, and my grandmother got involved and drew me into it. William James and his offspring, the positive thinkers, were huge in my life. Read the Napoleon Hill, Think and Go Rich, Dale Carnegie. Uh, and, of course, the great Norman Vincent Peale, who baptized the movement. By the way, Joel Osteen is the present-day heir of the positive thinking movement. And Oprah Winfrey is its new age harlot. <laughs> <laughs> Both, and I think especially o Osteen, have frightfully bewitching charm. The guy's just charming and wonderful as heck. Seems like our heretics are getting more appealing nowadays, <laughs> therefore more dangerous. I took a brief young at a run at Carl Jung, the great Swiss psychiatrist. I looked at astrology, the I Ching, related things. Finally, I fell into despair. Nothing had been good enough. And I began to think there's death and there's nothingness. I've heard that if an honest searcher lives long enough, he'll go mad, kill himself, or become a Catholic. <laughs> In low moods, 
because I really understood the suicides. <laughs> I, I never really went there, but I could understand why people did. I was very sympathetic. If you've ever had a clinical depression, don't, you won't be critical of people who killed themselves. They're trying to get out of pain is what it is. They're trying to get out of pain. Um, I wasn't ready to go mad, and it wasn't time to be a Catholic. I had a brief glimpse of Spinoza's ethics, and that rekindled a craving for God. Well, I just wanted to read stuff. I, it's like I had this list of the hundred books everybody ought to read. And uh, uh, Spinoza's ethics was on there, and so was the man who was Thursday. Uh, it came much later. I pri prayed and I cried out to God, suddenly just craving God, because I had gotten so far away. And I leaped tearfully and desperately into the evangelical movement of the late 70s with that neo-Pentecostal twist, the, the charismatic movement, and I was reborn. Those enthusiasms lasted for many, many years, and over time I mellowed into a traditional Southern Baptist. By then I had memorized much of the New Testament, taught Sunday school, and even preached some sermons. And naturally I wrestled with all the usual distractions, the rapture, post-pre- or amillennialism, can you lose your salvation, is there a second baptism in the Holy Spirit, and so forth. These might be valid questions, but I was not equipped to handle them. And the attempt nearly drained what little charity I had. That stuff would really take the love out of you. I enrolled in Wake Forest Baptist Seminary in North Carolina. Spent a year and a half grinding toward a Master of Divinity degree. And happily, I never finished it. <laughs> or I might have hardened into a respectable Baptist minister and I would not be speaking before you this evening. <laughs> That's supposed to be a laugh, too. <laughs> Fortunately for me, a serious taste for beer drinking and the sweet memories of show business nightlife derailed my seminary experience. I dropped out. I went back to show business. I was nearly 30 years old, and I'll tell you, God can use anything to redirect us, even Budweiser. <laughs> We're keeping up here. Check your time, buddy. Check your time. We're doing good? Oh, good. I'm going to be sensitive to the time. Everything's great. Now I've seen professional religion backstage, I'm disenchanted again, and soon I disgorged evangelicalism like an emetic. I was done. This time I went deep, deeper, and I discovered Nietzsche, the greatest Protestant of them all. <laughs> He's also a great magician. He knew all the tricks. He'd been backstage all the way back. He'd seen. He'd unriddled it all. If ever a man was haunted by God, his daddy was a minister who died young. If anybody was haunted by God, Nietzsche was this, it was Nietzsche, this guy. He was brilliant. His prose could dance like Nureyev, and with a touch of his toe, he could knock down whole edifices of religious and philosophic humbug, stuff that had stood for centuries, and for him, it was all humbug, and I agreed, and I devoured Nietzsche. He would destroy all the trappings, the props, the illusions, revealing at last the spiritual essence of everything with the dross completely burned away. It was exhilarating. Around that time, I read a book by James Randi, who was a stage magician. Somebody, some of you may know who he is. He followed in the footsteps of Houdini as a, what we call a debunker. He began to take on all the flim flam. Wrote a book called Flim Flam. It was a blistering, brilliant expose. He'd gone out and exposed these people, the, the spirit mediums. He unmasked all kinds of characters: mediums, crystal gazers, psychics of every stripe, spoon benders. You know, Uri Gallery. Uri Gallery busted him on the Johnny Carson show. The water witchers, the ESP researchers, and my favorite of all, he went after the faith healers. And that too was exhilarating. You can see how my inner life and my outer life have converged. I sort of acquired what I'll call a spirit-filled secular atheism. It took, it took me about four more years to ingest, digest, digest in Nietzsche, and a couple more years to completely disillusion with him. He is in the in, uh, philosophical terms, he is a boyhood enthusiasm, it is not sustainable. I had been fooled again, and I went down into the depression again. Good old Spinoza arrived, uh, sweetened me for a while. He was a, love that guy, Spinoza. If there's a heresy, a more beautiful heresy written, there isn't Nietzsche, but we can leave Spinoza. Uh, but all heresies, even the kindest ones, are incomplete, and it could not satisfy. As I entered my 50s, the love of alcohol slowly replaced the love of wisdom. My drinking escalated, and I was drinking alcoholically to the point that booze became a medicine for my soul. That's the great reality for alcoholics, by the way. Alcohol is not the problem, it's the solution. 
and it can be very effective for a very long time. I'm the type of guy that can never be satisfied with the routine pleasures that seem to satisfy so many other people. People go out and they like play golf, politics, televised sports, endless small talk, the drudgery of maintenance in life. It always bored me. Sometimes I wondered why everybody wasn't depressed. Can't they see how empty it all is, even their religious notions? Any of you have read Walker Percy, you'll understand my time. By nodding there. Yeah. I'm almost at the end, Dave. Yeah. Hang on every word. Ayn <laughs> Rand intrigued me for a while. Her Atlas Shrug was written in 1945. It was a timeless spot on dissection of the socialist, progressive, and crony capitalist evils of our day. Rand was an atheist, a fierce anti communist, anti communist, a rigidly logical thinker. Like Schopenhauer, she believed her philosophy actually explained everything. It was coldly logical, airtight. Within itself, it was irrefutable. It was very persuasive, and there was a lot of truth in it, and that bugged me. There was something there. But that was my whole frustration. There had been something in everything that had drawn me, and so much was contradictory. There was truth there. There was truth in everything I pursued, all of it, everybody, evangelicalism, everything. I had truth in some ways, but nothing satisfied. And I continued to drink. I was at wit's end. All had been about given up. I was trapped inside, if you will, a mental prison bound with contradictions. And then I read Orthodoxy. <laughs> so that was 2010. I'd heard of Chesterton. I thought everybody had heard of Chesterton. I really did. Sadly, nowadays, I find how many people don't know who he is. By the way, if you run to these people and they say, who's that? You know, tell them, I'm a distinguished member of the American Chesterton Society. <laughs> They're going to give you this quizzical ridicule. You might as well polish it up a little bit. <laughs> I'm a lifetime member, by the way. I, I pay dearly with love, blood, and money for that. And uh, I'm going to try to live a long time because I want to get my money's worth out of it. <laughs> it means a lot to me. Remember what I told you now. I'm a distinguished member. That's what you answered. Orthodoxy answered for me in a couple of sittings, in a few hours, what I had wrestled with for years. Remember the key that fits the lock? Well, I heard the tumblers just falling, clink, 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 perfectly into place. Of course, Ayn Rand had irrefutable logic. Her system was complete. A bullet, Chesterton said, is like the world, is perfectly round. But it's not the world. It's too damn small. <laughs> of course, Emerson or Nietzsche's prose was as beautiful as the northern lights and as inspiring. Brimming with truth, but not the whole truth. It was not universal. It was not Catholic. It was not Catholic. And Chester had pegged me and nailed me when he talked to me about the man who tried to get the cosmos into his head only to have his head burst. A Christian is invited to get his head into the cosmos where there's unlimited room to move around and no end of things to discover and enjoy in this life or the next. Think about that. Those are simple notions perhaps to many of you and not old new ones. But for me, this was like fireworks and it was liberating. In 2011, God arranged me to, for me to find, almost accidentally, the newly formed local Chesterton Society in San Antonio. They had just formed. I met kindred souls who were crazy like me and read the kind of weird stuff I read. I wasn't quite so alone. They were nearly all Catholics. I nearly shipwrecked all the meetings with endless questions about the church and all the usual Protestant objections to Catholicism. And they were so patient. Books that helped me at that time were George Weigel's Witness to Hope, the story of John Paul II. You can't read the life of that man and make fun of Catholics or think they're foolish. You can't. Or think that they have their morality wrong. William F. Buckley, his spiritual autobiography, Nearer My God, was profound for me. Also proved that even smart, there's room for even smart people in the Catholic Church. <laughs> A friend lent me a collection of John Henry Newman's sermons titled Against the Liberals. He didn't title the book. It was a collection of sermons by John Henry Newman. I read them, and it was just lighting me up. I read Conversion in the Catholic Church by Chesterton. There he described three stages of adult conversion. He said, first, you just be fair to the church. The moment you're fair to the church, you're going to start seeing that you start to like it. And then once you start liking it, you start falling in love with it. And the third stage is you start running from it. Because, you see, you were evaluating it, and now it is evaluating you. And 
and the hound comes up and snatches you right where you know, like a magnet, he says. My good friend Mike Dunnigan, who's a canon lawyer in San Antonio, was he eventually sponsored my confirmation. He said, finally asked me, he said, Brent, what is holding you back from joining the church? And I said, Mike, I just don't want to be fooled again. I received contingent baptism in 2012. I quit drinking in 2014. And I stand here no longer trying to hold to a religion, but rather being held by one. Held by God in Christ through his church and in the communion of his saints. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. smile. Would you come and help me also, please? Come right around this way. And what is your name? Gretelin. Oh, I'm delighted to have you here. And you know a lady named Victoria, don't you? Yeah, she's, she's a wonderful lady, Victoria. This is Gretelin. Here, I want you to stand so everybody can see you. That's your spot right there. Step forward to the row. I'll make a big production, but it is. I'm going to show you all, with the help of these ladies, a magic trick that was a favorite of Harry Houdini. This is historically a fact. He did this trick for years. He loved it. And even though he did all these spectacular escapes, he always did this trick in his act because he loved it. And he performed it in every show without fail until 1926. He was dead. <laughs> Um, what I do, what he did, and what I do with this is he had a half a dozen handkerchiefs. These are silk scarves. Yes, you can. Nice silk, yes. Half a dozen handkerchiefs. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to take uh, three of these handkerchiefs, and I'm going to tie them, if you'll permit me, I'm going to tie them with a knot like this. Would you hold that one, please? Thank you. Now, this is the important part. I'm going to take the, a left over right, the guys in the Navy, the Boy Scouts will know this, left over right, right over left, this forms a square knot, and it is very secure and snug. Can you see that? Do you like that? Say yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. One more knot, and we're ready. I have this. One more knot, and we're ready to begin. The left over the right, the right over the left. I want you to be the witness because they can't see it in the back. But did I tie that? Yes, you did. Is it a square knot? Yes, it is. Is it snug? Yes. Do you trust it? Yes, I do. Do you trust me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hold out your hand. The clean one. <laughs> All right. Seriously, you're going to Emily, seriously. I want you to be the keeper of the knot. That's your job, and you are to hold this position with the knots like this, facing the front. Hand held out gently like so. Don't move. All right. My dear, we're not gonna we're gonna knot yours, but I want to just do them like this. Hold loosely like this in both hands. That's great. Facing the front. Give everyone a great smile. Give them a hand for being such a good. Many call this the sympathetic handkerchiefs, and the whole principle of magic is things that have no causal re relation whatsoever cause things to happen. That's why skeptics say when people pray, they're just trying to practice magic, because what do saying words do to about changing the world? See? 
But I'm going to say magic words. Okay? These are magic words. Karaki, maki, saki, poof. Now the knots, ladies and gentlemen, have left Emily, flown through the air invisibly, and have tied the handkerchiefs over to my right. But please, pull back your thunderous applause. <laughs> I'm going to do a double whammy tonight. You ready? Correcty, nacky, zacky. Poof. The knots have flown back. <laughs> they are. You're holding on, aren't you? Oh, yeah. Doing a good job here. All right, I said it was, and this is the trick he did. He really did this. It's a simple trick. You usually got little ladies, young ladies from the audience. You've been holding the knotted ones, is that correct? Yes. And I have not touched them since I gave no. them to you. No. And you have been doing your job. Would you say she's done her job this yeah. 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 Let's get a seat, because I'm going to show you how Houdini did this. And, and let's try one, just one. Let's see. There's one here. That's one. <laughs> and let's see. Here is um, yet another. Yes, another. And then this one. And sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, it just works. And if it works, if it works, once again, you will give, please, my assistance. And it <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. I'd like to do more, but I don't know anymore. <laughs> Stuff at the Afterglow. In fact, I think I will. We got time for one more, though, right, Dale? Yeah, Just some, sure do. some little something or other. <laughs> What'd you say? Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm about to take up a collection. <laughs> some of that Baptist still in me. <laughs> We're gonna have a second love offering tonight. How much would you, how much would you be willing to pay to see another trick? <laughs> stuff that was traditional. I like traditional tricks, and I'm a traditional kind of guy, and I didn't realize this, but I, I've been a Thomist all my life. I just didn't know it, and it's not a joke. This one's not. It is, uh, if you understand uh, uh, epistemology and, uh, and all that kind of stuff, and you, what St. Thomas basically said is, what is, is, and what isn't, isn't. And the conversation's over. So that's what Tom Thomas is. Want to argue with that? They just go ahead and argue. There was a, a professor, uh, an Einstein kind of guy, and he had uh, he was inspired. Einstein was inspired by very simple objects like a clock or a light bulb, and he had three simple pieces of rope. That's all. And he was sitting. He would study simple things that would inspire great thoughts. Um, and so he had these three pieces of rope, and he said to himself, if I have three ropes, there must necessarily be three centers, or middles, and there must necessarily be six ends. And he counted one, two, three, four, five, six ends. And he, he would sit up late at night, and sometimes these things would make him crazy, or, or he'd actually stay up late to avoid having nightmares. And he counted these ends, and the strangest thing happened, he started to think, that one of the ropes had grown longer somehow than it had been before. Would you just sort of catch that rope for me, if you would, please, and make sure that that's just a piece of rope as I have so indicated. Another rope, more or less, just about this long. Yeah. If you would, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. You ever come to the end of the month, Dale, and find you a little short on things? Yeah, that's it. Ladies and gentlemen. Now, I could have sworn. And so did the professor. He said, I could have sworn that I had three ropes exactly and precisely the same length. Wouldn't you have sworn to that? Yeah. yeah. Look good to me. It is good. <laughs> now I'm equally certain that I have three ropes of unequal length. However, however, ladies and gentlemen, there are still of necessity six ends. 
And so he counted once again the ends, because he said, when I counted the ends, that's when the problem took place. One, two, three, four, five, six ends. Nothing changes. And as he sat there, though, he began to imagine something was happening in his hands. He thought, or imagined, or maybe it was a daydream, or maybe he had fallen asleep and was having a nightmare because he actually believed that he could see those ropes returning to their original length. Now, you and I know that is not possible. That could not happen, ladies and gentlemen. It, could, it couldn't happen. It doesn't happen. And that's why since uh, the early 40s, this has been referred to as the professor's nightmare. And if you think about it enough this evening, it might become your nightmare too. <laughs> Thank you. better tricks, but I'm saving them for another conference. Oh. <laughs>